this Sunday is a time on the church calendar after Easter and before Pentecost. So this morning, this Sunday, we're going to be focusing our service on that idea. Um, in, the, in the early church, Jesus had left and ascended to heaven, but yet God's Holy Spirit had not yet come. And I invite you to ponder how, for a Christian at that time, they might have felt. Maybe they were scared. Maybe they felt abandoned. Or maybe they were doubting their faith. Maybe they were worried about what might come next as their leader was just executed. What might happen next? What should they do? So I'm going to read to you a scripture, which will appear on the screen behind me, from Acts. It says, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up to the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The followers of Jesus at that time reacted in so many different ways, from chopping off an ear in Jesus' defense to verbally denying Jesus, to running away in fear of their own life. When they were faced with troubled and trying times, they had the choice to react in many different ways. And together, now we're going to sing a song called Trust and Obey as a declaration of our intent. So join us now as we sing. In our scripture reading that uh, Christina read from the book of Acts, the disciples thought that Jesus was going to restore his kingdom after Jesus rose from the dead. And then Jesus left. So this morning, we're in that space on the church calendar. And I want us to think about that. We've celebrated Easter um, but Pentecost hasn't come. So we're in this sort of space. And it's a space when the disciples thought a certain thing was going to happen in a certain way, and it didn't. And I'm wondering if you have ever thought that, right? Have you ever had an experience in your life where you thought God was going to do something in a certain way at a certain time, and then he didn't? I remember as a child, my brother's uh, good working dog was bit by a snake. And I was a kid, and I went outside later that night, and I laid hands on this dog, and I prayed for the dog that God would save the dog's life. And then my brother would come to know Jesus because the next day I was going to tell him that I prayed for the dog, and Jesus healed him because he loves him, and then he was going to follow Jesus the dog died. It didn't happen. And so when God doesn't work the way we expect him to, it can rattle your faith. And that rattled me as a small child. I was angry and, and I had very good reasons. And we all have very good reasons to tell God why he should act in a certain way. And then he doesn't. And then we get angry. And we say, well, then you must not be real. Or you must not be good. Or you must not love me. And it turns pretty sour pretty fast. And we can have a real good old temper tantrum to God. And it must look to God a lot like a small child saying to us as a parent, if you don't give me chocolate for breakfast, then you don't love me. At which we'd all <laughs> smile and say, I'm not giving you this because I love you. So today we heard the story of the disciples as they gathered around 
Jesus. And they said, is this the time you're going to restore your kingdom? They had a picture in their head of what was going to happen, and it didn't happen. They must have been in, a, in an emotional roller coaster. Jesus died. The grief, the devastation of losing their leader. And then he rose. Jackpot. Here he comes. Restore it. I see it now, Jesus. I get it. I get it. And then he ascended into heaven and didn't do all the things that he was supposed to do. And imagine how they felt, at the very least, confused. But we can learn from this passage a few things. We can learn that we aren't the only ones in history that gets it wrong. That's a comfort. The disciples also got it wrong to what they thought God was going to do. And we can learn not to get stuck in the past. The angels came along and they said to the disciples, Why are you standing here looking into the sky? You ever get stuck in the past? Even the good things God did in the past. We're stuck staring at them. And because God moved in a certain way, we think, well, that's the way he'll do it again. The other thing we can learn is what to do during a troubled time. When we're confused, when it's just all going sideways. Pray. Verse 14 tells us, that they returned to Jerusalem and they all joined together consistently, constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So when we find ourselves in troubled times, in confusing times, in times when we think God isn't acting the way he should, we need to pray. We need to just immerse ourselves into God, not focused on what we thought was going to happen, not what happened in the past, but seek God for the new thing that he is going to be doing. So if you have ever felt abandoned by God, confused as to why God isn't answering your prayers, then this sermon is for you. But it isn't about sitting and lamenting. It is about posturing yourself into a position of prayer, turning to God in prayer, saying to God, I'm ready. God, whatever it looks like, I'm ready for the new. I'm ready for today. What do you have for me? So it's not about looking what we had. The disciples looked at the clouds. And some of you have been here since this church was founded. You could look back at a lot of things. But we have a lot to learn from the people who have founded this church and how they have postured themselves. Two weeks ago, at our monthly call to prayer meeting, two out of the six people who attended were founding members of this church. And it hit me. What an example to us. We are here in this church because of their faithfulness to prayer. And they are still praying. Prayer changes things. And these founding members have seen many things over the 60 or more years that this church has been here. Many pastors have come and gone, but rather at looking at the past, they have embraced the Bible's example and prayed. And our prayers will always posture us in a position ready to receive the new thing that God has for us. In our passage, the prayerful posture of the disciples readied them for the arrival of God's Holy Spirit. We're going to learn about that next week at Pentecost. For months, I've been saying to look at the new. What is the new thing that God's been doing? We have new creation and to keep our eyes open for the new. But I want to tell you that you're not passive in this. It's not a sitting back waiting to see what God is going to do. You're not a spectator. You need to pray. Prayer matters. And it aligns our hearts with God. Prayer takes our eyes off our own expectations and what we think God should do. It takes our eyes off the past and it puts our eyes on God's plan and the heart of God. Prayer is communication. Communicating with the one who made us, the one who already knows our thoughts and our attitudes of our heart. And all communication is better than none. But effective communication is the best. 
And James 5 verse 6 says, The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We all want effective prayers, right? We want our prayers to work. (laughs) We want them to show something. We want to feel like something's been accomplished. And so how do we get those effective prayers? By learning from Jesus. Jesus who prayed in the garden before his greatest trial. And he said, not my will, but yours be done. Our prayers are not to be selfish. They're not a selfish request to get us out of a difficult situation. Our prayers should be for the salvation of our friends. Our prayers are for God's glory to shine through so that others may see that and be saved. You see, if you pray every time a trial comes to you, for God, take, take me out of it, end this trial, you will also lose the ability to give God glory. If you dodge the test, you dodge the testimony. Romans 5 verse 3 says, Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. What is that hope? Christ in you, the hope of glory. These people had Jesus in bodily form. And then he died. They must have wondered they got it all wrong. And then he rose again. How excited. They get it. He's going to bring in the kingdom. But they got it all wrong. The exciting part was that Jesus wasn't going to stay. But the Holy Spirit was going to come. This is a concept that they could never have imagined. God the Father was out there and he was big. And then his son Jesus came and he was talking. But God within us? How could they even pray for that? Because it was unfathomable. So if you are new to prayer, or you want prayer to become new to you because you're stuck in a rut, I have found a very simple but effective way to pray. And it has three words. Thanks, sorry, and please. If we pray in this way, we will have aligned ourselves And find that when we get to the please prayers, which is the asking for things, that we are praying God's will and not our own, and our prayers will be powerful and effective. So let's start with thanks. We need to start our prayers thanking God. Thanks takes our eyes off the problem and onto God who is our provider. If money is short, thank him for what you have, the house and the food. If friends are short, thank him for the one friend that you have. If you don't have any, thank him that he is your best friend and that he will never leave you or forsake you. If wisdom is short, thank you, thank him for giving you his written word and that you can freely read it without persecution, without death. Wisdom is contained in his word. And if love is short, Thank him that he loved you so much that he gave up his life for you and that you'll be together forever. And if health is short, thank him that this body ends and a new one comes and we don't have to live this way forever. Thank him for the doctors and the nurses that serve and make you healthier. Thankful people are grateful people and grateful people are joyful people. And it is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. It is not the joy of our North American prosperity that is our strength. It is not the joy of our healthy body that is our strength. It is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Philippians 4 says, The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. Thanking God changes your focus. So start all your prayers and all your communications with thanks. Sorry comes after thanks. And sorry is a tough one because it's the bringing of humility. We have become such an entitled people. Many people, when polled about how to get to heaven, talk about the fact that they haven't been that bad. 
they talk about all the good things that they've done. It's almost like when you go for a job interview and you really have to promote yourself and all the accomplishments and your capabilities and you talk about how great you are. But communication with God is no job interview. He knows your thoughts. He knows the very depths of your heart. No wonder the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2, don't be rash with your mouth and do not let your heart utter hastily, utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. God doesn't want to hear your best excuses. Sorry is confessing. Confessing our sins, confessing the attitudes of our hearts, and confessing our wrong motives and desires. This is the part of the prayer where we realize the enormity of God and the fragility of mankind. This is the part of the prayer where we realize the holiness of God and the sinfulness of mankind. And this is the part of the prayer where we realize that God who is the beginning and the end created us who are but dust here today and gone tomorrow. Our God is so great and so mighty and all-knowing and all-wise and all-present and all-powerful and all in all. Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. The God who sees, the God who knows, the God who created. Confession in prayer corrects our entitlement. Confession corrects our wrong thinking that salvation is by our good works. And it changes our perspective to realize that salvation is by the grace of God. So once you have thanked God and you have confessed, you have said sorry, the atmosphere has shifted. Our mind has shifted. The things on my list that I wanted to ask God for are somehow now irrelevant. They're meaningless. That difficult neighbor, that annoying coworker, suddenly become someone that I see that God loves dearly, whom he died for. That person now becomes the mission field to where I need to show God's grace, God's love, and God's mercy. How can I pray for this person? How can I love them? I pray for their salvation. Pray for the difficulties that they're facing. Bring them gifts. Bless them. Serve them. Invite them for dinner. Pour out God's love and mercy on them because God did that for us. So lastly, we get to the part of the prayer where we ask for things. And you see now things have shifted. And I'm asking for the salvation of my neighbor instead of a new job or that they get fired. I'm asking for how that prickly person that bothers me so much, how I can love them and reach them. Prayer changes things. But when we pray, first with thanks, then with sorry, and lastly, with please, the most important thing that changes is the attitude of our heart. Then once that has taken place, scripture comes true, and the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And we're not righteous because of what we've done but righteous because of Jesus' blood that covers us and that we have been made right with him because of the unmerited grace upon me. That I am so thankful for that grace and that my prayers change and they align with God's heart. So if you're in a difficult situation at the moment, spend time with prayer, in prayer with God every day. The disciples felt in their mind that God had abandoned them. By his greatest gift, his Holy Spirit was just around the corner. But they didn't see it yet. So they trusted God. They went back to Jerusalem, and they spent time in prayer. And we are put in a community, in a church family, so that we can pray for each other. Don't go at this alone. Don't let the devil's shame isolate you. We are all sinners, saved by God's grace. God created us as a body, 
created us as a community so that we can help each other and support each other and pray for each other. So let's do what the disciples gave us the example and pray together. So this week, pray. Pray thanks. Pray sorry. And then, play pr pray please. So, before we stand together and sing again, please join with me in prayer. Father God, thank you for your great love for us, for your creation, that you would not give, on up, give up on us when we turned from you, but you sent your only son to die for our sins. Jesus, thank you that for the joy set before you, the joy of being with us eternally, you were willing to suffer and die. Holy Spirit, thank you that you have made your home in our hearts. God, we confess our entitlement. We confess how quickly we forget that we are but dust, and our very next breath comes only from you. We confess how quickly we pray to you to alleviate our problems, rather than for your glory to shine through them. Forgive us, Lord. God, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us show so love. Where there is injury, pardon. And where there is doubt, to sow faith. Where there is despair, to bring hope. Where there is darkness, to shine your light. And where there is sadness, to bring your joy, for it is our strength. Lord, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console others. To be understood as to understand and to love as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.